We, uh, like we've been mentioning, uh, we're going to have, we're uh, ha- emphasizing our missions. It's a mission Sunday, and we've done this differently throughout the years. Um, we had, Donovan Thickpen was actually scheduled to be here with us. Donovan is part of uh, One Church in Jackson, and uh, unfortunately because of uh, some health concerns for him, he wasn't able to be here with us today. And uh, I've actually tried to get him a couple of years, and it's just not worked out. Um, but Donovan was scheduled to preach. He uh, wasn't able to make it, so unfortunately you, you're stuck with me again today. But, um, but uh, One Church is... Um, is a church that you have helped start uh, in the Jackson Ridgeland area. And you say, well, I didn't know that I helped start a church. And you did so by your gifts. You, the, what we, the way we do our, um, our offerings, if you gave, over, you know, this, just as we pass it around, is that we take what is given, given and of course it, our offerings go to, to uh, you know, to not only to, you know, to help us, what we do here, to help us, um, you know, to function as a ministry, supports our local efforts, um, but also goes beyond these walls. And in your bulletin, there's a, there's um, uh, all the uh, missions and agencies and missionaries that we support are listed here. And so you can pull that out if you want to real quickly. And um, and one that I actually forgot was Magnolia State Church Planners. I did not include those, which Donovan would have been the one representing that. Um, and what's so ironic about it that we didn't include is I'm actually the president of that organization, and so I forgot it. But, uh, but that's okay. But Magnolia State Church Planners is an organization that helps start, like, our, our goal, our, what we try to do is we want to plant new churches within the state and the surrounding areas. And we want to do that because we know that, and you know this, like churches aren't doing so great. In fact, we're we're losing more churches than we're gaining by far. And a lot of these churches are getting older and older, and they're they're just and as they go and they die off, we need new churches. And so Magnolia State Church Planners, that's an organization that you support. And uh, our part of your offering uh, each week as you give goes to them. And then you can see also, I'm not going to, I won't, I'll just real quickly go through each of these. You can see there's a little number on, on underneath the picture and on the back it shows what they are. Endeavor, number one, they share the love of Jesus with international Muslim students attending local colleges and universities throughout the United States. The missionary, I'm not going to name his name, uh, but the missionary who uh, and his family uh, has been here a couple of times. And uh, this is sort of one of those that's uh, a little bit covert, so we don't give a ton of information. We don't post this publicly, um, but this is the ministry and they're, and, uh, that they're doing. Um, Mid-South Christian College, number two, that's a, a Bible college in, the Memphis, uh, in Memphis. They're preparing full-time harvest workers, and we support them. Um, part of what we do is that we have emergency funds and it's building in, in, built into our missions as well as special projects, and they, those are set aside for special relief aid, special projects, a particular need that may arise on the field. Number four there, West Isle Ministries. That's Evan and Courtney Strickland and their family. They're working in Newfoundland, the uh, Labrador, Canada, um, church planning. Um, of course, that's a great commission, number five. Number six is Partners in Mission. This is a work that's going on in the Ukraine. Uh, they training national leaders for ministry there. Um, number seven is the Christian Holy Land Foundation. They are in, uh, they are in the, uh, Israel and the surrounding areas where they're sharing the love of Jesus. You would think, hey, right where, like, where Jesus was born and did ministry would be all Christians, right? This just isn't the case, but they're doing that there. Uh, number eight is Christian Action and Relief for Haiti. Um, Jumi Septembre. Jumi's been here multiple times. Good friend of mine. Uh, they're doing work in Haiti, education, church planning, orphanage care for Haitian uh, families. Sunshine Christian Camp, just right up the road here. Uh, you helped start this. You've had your hands in, involved in this in many, many ways, helping young people know about Jesus, fun, safe environment. Christ Mission South India, that was the video that we just saw there. And uh, they are reaching into uh, areas of India that, um, like rural areas, sometimes totally, like where they've not even heard the name of Jesus. Like they don't know who Jesus is. And they're training preachers, planning churches. 
Um, locally, we build money into our missions budget for what we can do locally. We know we want to uh, impact our community, glorify God through local outreach. And then the last one is Cliff Gerald uh, Foundation, Global Foundation for Orphan Children. This is Donna's brother. Uh, they are uh, doing work in Nigeria with orphaned, uh, again, with orphaned children and widows there. And so that's the money. Like, again, you collect, we, we give, you give to a general fund, and, and approximately 15% of that money goes out, and it's going out all over the world. And Jesus says in, in Luke 7, 22, uh, or Luke, Luke says, so he replied to the messengers, go back, report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. And so that's what you're doing. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for, for, uh, for, for giving to missions. And thank you for... Um, help doing exactly what Jesus did. Each of these organizations are, are uh, working in, in, in that manner. Lavelle Smith, I'm going to ask him if he can come up and, and have a word of prayer. He uh, over, gives oversight. He oversees our missions uh, team. And so uh, he's going to pray for us. If you have any questions about like the, the insert or if you want to be part of the missions team, um, Feel free to see Lavelle, and uh, if he doesn't have he'll, the right answer, I'm sure he can get. I'm sure he can get it somewhere. So, uh, I'm turning over to you. And if you wouldn't mind, have prayer. Appreciate it. Father, we're thankful for this day and the opportunity that we have to assemble and to worship and to give thanks. Lord, we pray that as we focus on missions today, that you would help us as a church to be good stewards of the great commission that you have given us. Mm -hmm. Lord, that we would reach out into all the world being witnesses for you. Help us to remember that we are to start at home. Mm -hmm. And Lord, to reach out to everyone. And we know that everyone needs to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Lord, we want to pray especially today for all these missionaries, and the mission works who sacrifice so much to go and to take your message to all the world. Lord, especially those that we support prayerfully and financially here with this church body, we pray your special blessings upon them. Mm -hmm. Give them strength, give them wisdom, give them knowledge. We pray that you would continue to bless us as a church as we try to serve you in every way. Mm -hmm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, I, uh, like I said, I, I really wasn't intending to preach today. Uh, I was going to let Donovan take care of, of the preaching. Uh, but last week we started a, a new series of messages just entitled Asking for a Friend. And I hadn't intended to, uh, to preach this particular message. However, I felt like as, as I just uh, thought about, thought through this, that this is a great question for us to cover. And really it goes along exactly with what our sister Jane was just talking about in terms of the Great Commission. And of course we know we have a commission that we've been commissioned to go and to share. But what do we say? Like what's the, like what's the, the word? Like what, what, do, what are we going to give them? And so today we're going to ask us a really important question that I think every single person in here you should know. And that's simply the question is like what's the plan of salvation? Like, what, what, what's the, and, and really, or maybe to put it a little bit differently, how does a person respond to the grace, of God's grace, through Jesus? I heard about a man who went forward during the invitation hymn at a church, and he got to a front, and there was a, a, a worker up there, a counselor, told him to kneel and to pray, and to prayer, and he was praying a sinner's prayer. Another counselor came and asked him if he would sign a car. And then another counselor came up to him and put his arm around him and said, watch for the light, brother. He said, when I was saved, I prayed and I saw a bright light. Another counselor came up to him and he said, hold on, brother, hold on. Another, another one came and said, let it go, brother, let it go. And the man said, well, between praying, the, you know, prayer and signing a card and holding on and letting go and watching for a light, I nearly went to hell. <laughs> um, so Christians agree that salvation is found in Christ alone, 
right? And that's why I don't particularly love the phrase plan of salvation because Jesus is the plan of salvation. Like, he's the plan of salvation. His coming to earth as a man living a sinless life, dying on the cross, defeating death by the resurrection, that's the plan of salvation. Right? Well, we, we sang, you know, in Christ alone is well. That's the plan. But Christians disagree sometimes in the response. How does a person come to make Jesus their Lord and Savior? And of course, this is an important question because we don't want to get this wrong, right? I mean, and so what are we going to? So what we're going to do this morning is we're just going to simply just try our best to understand what Scripture says. Now, I think it's important for you and, and me to understand when we're reading through the Bible that there are two covenants. That we, that we have, right? We have the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. We have a New Covenant, the New Testament. The Old Covenant was for Israel. It contained the law. It contained instructions for worship, how to function as a nation. And while we can and should learn from the Old Covenant, we, as Christ followers, are under the New Covenant. And so we turn to the New Testament for instructions on how to be saved. But in particularly, not only just the New Testament, but, there's, but the parts of the New Covenant or the New Testament that's been established after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so parts of what we read in the Gospels really wouldn't even be included here because they chronicle the life of Jesus. So, and so we need to look at some of the latter parts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We need to especially look at the book of Acts and as people come to know Christ and, and Paul's writings and Peter's and Jan, John's and James throughout the, nest, the rest of the New Testament. And so this border, with that in mind, I want us to, to look at these accounts of how people became Christians, like what they did, what they did, you know, how did someone respond? They wanted to respond to God's grace through Jesus Christ. And so if you've got your Bible, turn over to Acts chapter 2. And we're going we're gonna to be there. This is familiar for some. This is maybe going to be reviewed for others. But Peter, in, in Acts chapter 2, Jesus has just recently ascended into heaven. And the apostles are going out on the streets and they're preaching that Jesus is God's son, that he died, that he was raised to life three days later. And they were doing this on this special holiday. We've, we've heard of this, right, called Pentecost. Pentecost just simply means 50 days after Passover. And you'll remember that Jesus was crucified over that Passover on Passover weekend. So this is now, <coughs> excuse me, two months after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. And so Peter is the one preaching. And he's speaking to this large crowd who wanted Jesus just a couple of months earlier, to be crucified. And then look what he says beginning in verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Therefore, let all, uh, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter said to the other apostles, and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Now notice, they're, they're asking the same question we're asking today, right? What do we do? Like, what do we do about this? How do we become a Christian? They wanted to, you know, they were cut to the heart. They, give, they want to know, like, how to be saved. Look at Peter's response, verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And so Peter's really clear. He's out here preaching, and he tells the people, he said, look, Jesus was sent here by God. 
Uh, he, this is God's son. He was like, he was proven by miracles he performed, but you, along with wicked men and the Roman government, have him crucified. But you need to know this. You need to know that Jesus died, but God raised him back to life. And right now and forever, he is both Lord and Christ. He is the Messiah and Savior of the world. And Peter's message was so powerful that according to Luke, he, it says that they were cut to the heart. And so they, right there, they, 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 they were convinced. They're like, they, they knew that what they had done was wrong. They had crucified the Messiah. Now we see that the first step to becoming a Christian is that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That you come to understanding, just this belief that Jesus, like He died for our sins. He was raised from the dead. He is both Lord and Christ. And so this is kind of just the very first step, isn't it? I mean, again, we understand that God, there's a God who created the universe that sin messed it all up. We, you know, we point to the fall of Adam and Eve, that our sin separates us from God. It's corrupted everything. It's messed everything up. As a result, we have all kinds of this disorder and dysfunction in our world. But God had a plan, and God's plan would include sending his own son into the world to die for my sins and for yours. The late George Mark Elliott was a professor at Cincinnati Christian University. And one day as he was wrapping up a lecture, Dr. Elliott stood before the class with a clenched fist. And he asked the class to guess what he had in his fist. And some said it's paper chalk uh, or a paper, uh, paper clip. Others said chalk. And some said a, maybe like a paper wad. A few said a penny. And he called five students from the class, and he took them from the side, and he showed them what he had in his hand. And he said, I want you to simultaneously tell the class what I have in my hand here. And they all said, he has a penny. And then he said to the rest of the class, he said, okay, now I want you to raise your hand if you believe I have a penny in my hand. And everybody raised their hand. And he opened up his fist, and there was a penny. And now he said, okay, now I want you to raise your hand if you believe I have a penny in my hand. And everybody again raised their hand, and he said, oh, no, 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 no. Now you don't believe it. Now you know it. See, the, the Bible says that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. We cannot prove that Jesus came back from the dead. We don't have video footage. There was no camera at the grave. There's no YouTube. You know, there, there's nothing like this, right? But as we talked last week, there's very good reasons why you can trust the reliability that it happened. We have reliable evidence. We have a fulfilled prophecy, the, the rapid growth of the church, countless lives who have been changed over billions through the years. And so when it comes to become a Christian, that's where we begin. Like just this belief like that Jesus is who he says he is, that, that he was legitimately uh, Lord and God. And then we move to a confession of our faith in Christ. After we've heard the good news, we've examined the facts, we, we move to this proclamation that Jesus is Lord and that we have a total dependence upon him for our salvation. Verse 37, it records the, the crowd asking Peter and others, what shall we do? What shall we do? And when you confess your faith in Jesus, you're declaring that he is the Lord of your life. And first and foremost, church, listen, what do we do? We're confessing that we have sinned, right? I mean, we're, we're confessing that, like, through prayer, that we're, con you know, Lord, save me. We're crying out to him because of our sin. We come clean. We let him know. I want Jesus to lead my life for the rest of my life. I want him to be my Lord and my Savior. But then, not only that, it moves from, you know, we confess to others our faith in Jesus. And, of course, we may do this uh, in a small group or a large group, but I think this is something that we do ongoing on a regular basis. We're saying, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. 
the Son of the living God. Bob Russell tells a story about a man that attended his church by the name of Charlie Moore. And Charlie had been transferred uh, to the, uh, by his job to a new city. And, and when he took a job, this is his job, he immediately joined the, the company softball team. And he wasn't a very good softball player at all, but he thought, hey, this will be a good way to, to get to know some people. Well, during the first game, he heard somebody in the stands yelling, come on, Mr. Moore, you can do it. Come on, Mr. Moore, that a boy, Mr. Moore. And on his way home, he said to his, to his wife and his son, he said, boy, uh, or on his way home, he said to his wife and son, he said, boy, there was somebody up in the stands who kept yelling at me. I didn't think anybody knew me, but come, somebody kept saying, come on, Mr. Moore, come on, Mr. Moore. And his son said, Dad, that was me. And he said, well, why didn't you just call me Dad? And he said, because I didn't want anybody to know I was related to you. <laughs> and you know, when we're in a relationship with Jesus, we ought to be proud of him. I mean, don't you love it when a little child says, that's my daddy. Or some of you, you've got a bumper sticker that says, you know, uh, I, I am for Ole Miss or our state or, you know, what, or whatever. A young woman is engaged, is in love. She says to her friend, this is my fiance." I had a grandfather this week uh, just tell me, introduced me to his granddaughter, said, isn't she so pretty? We ought to have no shame in saying, hey, Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. I'm not ashamed of him. That's confession. That's the, what this crowd, that is, that, you know, that's what this crowd was doing in Acts chapter 2. Uh, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now what do we do about it? And that leads us to the third thing here. It's repentance. It's repentance from sin. Peter tells him in verse 38, repent. Repent. Now, that word is a, uh, you know, in Greek, it's, uh, it means to change or, uh, to, or like change the mind. It's, it's literally a change of direction is what repentance means. You change your lifestyle. Peter said Jesus is both Lord and Christ because he's that. We are grateful for that. But he says he's also Lord, right? He's not just your Savior, but he's also Lord. And so that means that he has the, the, the right to tell us what to do, how to live our life. We submit to his authority. He is the king. So to repent literally means that my life is going to go in the opposite direction. That I'm no longer like going to be, I'm not going to be the king anymore. I'm going to follow the kingship of Jesus. And repentance doesn't mean that you're never going to sin again. I wish it did. I wish it did. I, I wish I didn't have to struggle with some of the sinful junk that I deal with. But and so repentance is ongoing. It's a constant change. It's a constant recognition of the sin in my life and the willingness to change and to turn from it. I mean, that means that when we sin, we're not only sorrowful about it, but we do something. Remember when Judas... He felt guilty about betraying Jesus. He knew he was guilty. He even felt remorse from it, but he didn't change. Peter, on the other hand, though, that same night, or that night, remember, he denies Jesus three times. Jesus predicted that he would. Peter felt guilt. He felt remorse. And later, he, he would change. His life would be transformed. Repentance means to go in the opposite direction. Max Licato wrote a book several years ago. Now, and in this book, he, he, he repeated the same little tagline all throughout the book. I love it. It's just, it said just simply this, God loves you the way you are, but he refuses to keep you that way. He refuses to keep you that way. When you come to Jesus for salvation, you come just as you are. You ain't got to get cleaned up. You don't, there's nothing you have to do to prepare to get ready. You come just as you are, but God isn't going to leave you like that. He'll change your heart completely if you will allow him to. But that's part of that is repentance. Being sorrowful for our sin, but not just being sorrowful, but changing direction as a result. And then Peter tells him, he says, repent, and he tells him something else. He says, repent and be baptized. All of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so, another part of becoming a Christian is our baptism in Jesus. Now, there's a lot of controversy here. Do we 
you know, and this is, you know, we I've preached entire messages on this, and we could talk a lot about this, but there's a lot of controversy. Do we baptize infants or adults only? Do we baptize by sprinkling water on someone or pouring water, or do we do it by immersion? Is baptism just a kind of like just something that happens after salvation, and we just kind of do it to maybe join a local church? Lots of questions. Well, first of all, there's no indication in Scripture that of an infant being, of being baptized in order to become a Christian. Now, why would you think that? Well, because an infant is incapable of believing, confessing, and repenting of sin, right? A Christian is someone who has decided for themselves that they want to accept Christ and follow Him with their lives. Infants aren't going to do that. And then another question comes up, well, it would be the mold, right? How should I be baptized? Should I be poured, sprinkled, uh, immersion? Well, the biblical mode, the New Testament, what we find in the New Testament is immersion. When Paul talks about baptism, for example, in Romans chapter 6, he says that we are buried with Jesus. Now, when you bury something, what do you do? Do you sprinkle a little bit of dirt over it? Or do you pour some dirt over it? Or do you cover it completely with dirt to bury something. And so our baptism is a burial. It's, a, it's an immersion. It's a picture of the death of the burial, resurrection, and Jesus. Now, this process seems pretty straightforward to me. This is what we see play out throughout the book of Acts. Belief, confession, repentance, baptism, and making Jesus Lord of their life. And so, for example, in Acts chapter 16... Remember the jailer where Paul and Silas are in jail and God shakes the prison doors and they open up and the jailer's just shook. He's like, what, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And in Acts 16, uh, Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. Now, if that were the only verse that talked about how to be saved, we would go around telling people, all you have to do is believe. Right? Just simply believe and you'll be saved. But then Paul writes in Romans 10, verse 9, he says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Now, if those were the only two verses of Scripture that talked about salvation, we would go around telling people what they need to be, to, you know, in order to be a Christian, would be to believe in Jesus and to confess Jesus, and you will be saved. Well, those are the only two verses. Paul says in Romans, or excuse me, in 2 Corinthians 7, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Now, if that were the only verse of Scripture, we would tell people, just repent. Just simply repent. But, but that's not the only verse. And then in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes uh, about how Noah and his family were saved in the ark and the waters and the flood. And he writes this. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if that were the only verse we had, we would just say, hey, just go be baptized, right? Don't worry about it. Just, just get wet, and you'll be saved. But, but that isn't the only verse either. And so when we look collectively at the pages of the New Testament, we see that each of these things are a process of part of what it means to be a Christian. Does the Bible say that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that you'll be saved? Yes. Does the Bible say that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you will have salvation? Yes. Does it, the Bible say that repentance leads to salvation? Yes. Does the Bible say baptism? Now, Peter says, now saves you all? Yes. And so what should someone do who wants to receive God's free gift of grace through Jesus Christ. Well, they believe with their heart that Jesus is Lord. Confess with their mouth that Jesus is Savior. You turn away from your sin through repentance. 
and you're baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then that person just walks faithfully with Christ for the rest of their life. And we, we tend to make it a little more difficult than we should, but it isn't difficult. Now, I also want you to understand this as we kind of get down to the, toward the end here. I, 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 this isn't some magic formula. This isn't like do steps one, two, three, four, and then you'll be saved, right? This isn't just some like hoops that you jump through. This is all about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is about a saving relationship with Jesus where you are faithfully following him. He invites you to follow. He doesn't invite you just to simply jump through hoops or jump through steps in order to be saved. This is an ongoing relationship with him. You can do all of these things, but if you're not surrendering to him daily and faithfully walking with him, you're just kidding yourself. But the good news is this. That if you've placed your faith in Christ, you can be totally confident this morning that your salvation is secure and you have nothing to prove. You remember the show American Idol? I actually think it's still on. Somebody says still, it's still on. It's been on for years. I'm not sure how many years it's, it's been on now. Um, I, but I think we watched maybe the first year it came on. We watched several of those years. Uh, not so much anymore, but one of the most popular shows in all time. But on American Idol, the contestants, if you watch it, it's nerve-wracking, right? I mean, I can't imagine being part of, you know, one of those contestants because they have to, like, you have to perform big time. You've got to nail every lyric. You have to hit every note. If your stage presence is weak or you have a bad night, you're off the show, right? But at the end of each season, a winner would be crowned, and they would sing one more time. Except this, now, it's different. This time, they're not worried about singing it perfectly or forgetting the lyrics. This time, why? They're singing for joy because they've just been crowned the winner. Now, as they sing, they could do so anxious free. They just use their gifts and sing unlike ever before. And you've seen them do this. Sometimes they can't get through it. Sometimes they're off. Sometimes they forget the word. But they don't care because they just won the whole thing. This is what we find when it comes to our salvation in Jesus Christ. We don't have anything to prove, we don't have anything to fear. The victory is won. Jesus has done the work. Jesus is the plan of salvation. And he has invited you to wear, to receive a crown that will never fade, that will never be taken away. And so for us, church, the pressure's off. The pressure's off. So for us, we place our faith in Christ. We faithfully just give him our life, and now we can just sing. And we just serve. And we just use our gifts for the glory of God. Jesus is the plan of salvation. He invites you to be part of that. If you've never trusted him to be the Lord and Savior of, of, uh, of your life, hey, we, I've just told you how to do it. We can do that today. I mean, you can do all of those things if you believe and, you can confess the name of Jesus before church family. You can repent of your sins, turn away from those, and be baptized in Christ. We can do that. We can do that today. We can do it later today. We can do it whenever. But don't wait. Don't wait. Today is the day of salvation. Um, we're going to do a, an invitation in just a minute. We're going to sing about God's incredible, amazing grace. Again, the, the plan, God's amazing plan from the very beginning of time was to send Jesus. And so I'm going to pray, and if you've got a, a decision that you want to make or you want to talk more about it, we'll invite you as we sing. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that, uh, that you cared enough about us to, to show us how to come to you. And Father, thank you that you cared mostly enough about us that you sent Jesus into the world. 
Lord, it's your grace, your amazing, amazing grace. That's the only way, that's the only reason that any of us can be saved. It's not anything that we do of our own, Lord. It's all, it's all you. But Lord, you've asked us to respond to it, and we've seen how. Let's pray for those who may need to make that decision. I pray, Lord, for each of us to just daily to walk and sing and to be confident of our salvation that we have in Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's be standing. We invite you to sing, to worship.